we're revisiting a subject. Yeah. Cicadas. Oh, it's that time oh. again, huh? <laughs> cicada invasion. It's cicada time. The sequel. Jessica, welcome back to Star Talk. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here to talk cicadas. I got to ask a quick question. Yeah. Okay. Someone asked me whether other animals feel love the way humans do. And I said, I told them some years ago, I studied cockroaches. Like, rather than chase them and kill them, I collected them in a jar and just watched them when they didn't think I was looking. So they weren't running away from me trying to not die. They were yeah. just doing their thing. And it, they clean themselves often. Yeah. They clean their antennas often. And often two of them would come together and rub their antennas. Yeah, communication. Yes. Right. Yeah. And they definitely know how to make baby cockroaches. Yeah. So as far as I was concerned. That's why they rub those antennas. <laughs> <laughs> what you doing later? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I'm not going to deny them that affection if I know that they rub their antennas and they make babies. But they rub their antenna because they're doing what's called chemosensory. So they're detecting kind of chemical Chemicals, cues right. on their body. Ants and they do, do that, that too, whether right? they like each other or whether they hate each other. They're right. still going to do that communication. So it's not always love. The last time you were here, we talked about a cicada outbreak. <laughs> what do you call them? An emergence. An emergence. <laughs> an emergence. An emergence. Right. An emergence. An emergence. An emergence. Cicada emergence back yeah. in 2021. All right, we brought you back. Because of the rumors that there's another brood, 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 a brood, brood of cicadas that are coming. Not just that, there's two coming out simultaneously. Ooh. This year, this year is 2024. Brood 13 and brood 19, if I remember my Roman numerals. Mm -hmm. Is this correct? There's multiple broods coming out. These are two cycles that happen to match up mm -hmm. just in the, in the rhythm of nature. So are they two different species so, or subspecies of cicadas? They're, they're, two, <laughs> they're two different <laughs> broods, so each brood sometimes can have multiple species, part of it, or subspecies. There's some taxonomy that people are still working out. Uh, but every couple of hundred years, you end up having these kind of multiple broods syncing up together. Um, so, so it's just simple phasing. So if you if you come out every five years and someone else comes out every seven years, in 35 years, seven boom, times five is 35, you got a double mm -hmm. boom. Right. Okay. And what that means is like huge numbers. So if we expect a regular brood, uh, like a, a medium or large size brood, uh, to have maybe a few million, if not a few billion uh, individuals, and then you have another brood that's also coming at the same time, Put those numbers together, right? This is going to be a loud, wild spring. I was somewhere where you had to sweep the cicadas off the street. Oh, Otherwise, you'd be crunching them as you walk. Oh, that sounds so yeah. terrible. As people will hear from all this, the sound when the cicadas come out, it's a lot of individuals. Their strategy is satiation strategy. So there's just so many of you that come out at once. Hopefully, your brothers and sisters get eaten and you right, don't. Right, and you don't. So that the whole wait what, wait what 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 did you just say? Yeah. yeah. So the idea, right? We think it, what has driven this in evolution is that there's so many individuals that have emerged. You're protected, right? You kind of have the protection that you have so many brothers and sisters that also it's came in out. Numbers. Right. Yeah, you strengthen numbers. So you're more likely that others will get picked off by a bird, a lizard. Kind of like being a sperm cell. We're here because. All those other sperm cells aren't. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The other ones are dead. The other right, right. Actually. Cicadas as adults are really important because they're like a huge food source. So when they emerge, ah. they emerge in like the millions, if not billions, right? And that's really important food. That's nutrients that go into the community. Mammals eat them, birds eat them, reptiles eat them. So as the adult, they're like really important food source. And then as a juvenile stage, they're drinking and then pooping and they're putting, that actually is like part of the nutrient cycle okay. in the soil. Okay. So wait, 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 wait. How important can it be if you're a food source for mammals once every 17 years. years. Usually there's a, a kind of like a boom uh, in populations for right after a periodical cicada emergence, you see a boon in like higher numbers in populations for, for the things that are predators, the things that are normally right. going to be eating these cicadas. Because why wouldn't they be? Because the food is abundant. Food, right. so you can make so they, so you they made, more resources for mating. So they prop, they serve as a replenishing source. Maybe, maybe if the, if, if, if a, to boost the, boost to the boost population. the population of other species. Yeah, they, they can do that. So what month will this kick in? Well, like most insects, they really start getting busy, you know, June, July, when it's hotter. So how do you know this? How do I Did know? Did you go down and ask them? They're just buried under the ground. They've right. been there for seven years. So there's the rub. In theory, right, the last time these individuals were out, the females and males mated, they laid eggs, the eggs hatched from a tree branch, dropped to the ground, burrowed underneath a tree that, list that lasted the last 17 years, and they've been drinking plant saps. They've been drinking xylem. But... In the last 17 years, we've built parking lots, 
We've changed oh, no. the landscape. Oh, no. We've cut down trees. Oh, wait, wait, no. So some cicadas can't come up because the parking lot is above their head? So as you say, how do you know they're going to come up? We know they should come out in this area, right? But it, we always aren't certain until they start coming they're out. They're not coming many? through the, the concrete the cement. Yeah, and yeah. the tree that was cut down, they died because they don't have any sap. That can happen. So habitat loss is like a really serious concern for that cicadas. So for periodical cicadas, uh, what we hope every year is that we get a big emergence in an area. But there have been parts of their range that they've gone extinct, like locally extinct. Oh, we terrible. used to have a lot more in the five boroughs, for example. Of New York we, City. Yeah, uh -huh. for the broods that come out there are supposed to come out around here. And we haven't seen them recently, other than a little bit in Long Island. They ain't coming up in right. Fifth Avenue. Wait, so where in the United States is most susceptible, if not Times Square, New York? I was not susceptible, most lucky to receive this, this yeah, yeah, yeah. opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, let me try yeah. again. Uh, so, Jessica, <laughs> what, who among other humans will be graced with the presence of billions of cicadas? <laughs> uh, so we're going to be expecting this in kind of the Midwest. So if you're in Illinois, you probably will expect to experience this. Parts of Indiana, you'll expect to experience But it. Chicago's in Illinois, so not in Chicago. How about Lakeshore, where you have some vegetation? Well, really, it has to do with past land use changes. Remember, because so if there were forests that were cut down, we tend to see that the broods don't necessarily still exist in okay. those ranges. Uh, so we aren't going to be expected to see any in our area. Here but in New next York. year, next year, uh, New York, New Jersey, uh, we can all go out and see. Brood, I think it's brood two that emerges next year. What you'll first see maybe are these things that are called cicada chimneys. It looks like little kind of bits of dirt that are sticking up from the ground. Then you'll start I seeing wonder holes. What those, I've seen those. Those are called chimneys. And that's when they're really close to the to the surface and they're kind of little breathing tubes. Then you'll start seeing holes. And this is where the, the nymphs have emerged. Um, and it looks just like someone has like like put a cane or like a stick and made little holes all through the, maybe you'll see it in your backyard or maybe you'll see it in the park. So they're you. arming themselves. That, that's <laughs> them kind of crawling out. The juveniles look totally different from the adults and they find vegetation. Sometimes it's bark. Sometimes it's like twigs or, or branches and they start climbing up. They have an impulse to, to climb vertically upwards. Whatever it is. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. And so what you might see if you go to a park or if, you, if you're near trees is you might see these things that look like brown, um, almost like humpbacked uh, creatures with claws that are on the ends of their feet that are clinging to the bark or to the vegetation. That's the baby, right? No, it's a horror movie she saw last night. <laughs> <laughs> She's confused. <laughs> they have to attach to the tree pretty well because then what they use, they, they use their, their blood is called hemolymph. Uh, so they kind of shunt their hemolymph and like push with pressure and the adult basically Pops cracks up. open the back which sounds grosser than it is it's beautiful to watch and then the adult emerges the adult has wings and the adult um ha usually they have that for periodical cicadas have reddish colored eyes um and then it's still a little bit of time before they start singing so there's going to be a period of time when you might see these adults but you don't hear anything right. and then boom like once their skin is hard um, their skin is called the cuticle. It needs to harden up. Males have a, an organ called the timbal organ, which is basically like the skin of a drum, and it vibrates. It needs to be, the cuticle is very soft when it first comes out of the, the shell. Uh, the exuvia is what we call it. Uh, so it hardens up. So there's about a week where you're just seeing them, but you're not hearing them, and then all of a sudden you'll hear the and males. And that's the drum beat off of yeah. that. <laughs> that really loud. The sound and is species specific. Are you, are you, are, are you species fluent? I mean, can you hear, can you imitate a cicada? Uh, I'm not good at imitating a cicada. I can kind of tell the difference between some of the sounds because some of them are, it's like, they'll be like, like Morse code, dash, 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 dot, 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 dash, dash, you know, things like that. You can kind of tell the length mm -hmm. of the, of the mm -hmm. gaps and spaces. And is this um, song a mating song? Or? Yeah, yeah. It is. I was going to ask you that. It is. So the sound is communication. So the males are communicating two things. One thing that they're communicating is that they can sing loud. And if you sing loud, it's very energetically expensive right. to do that. Uh, means you're probably a good mate. You probably have fitness. You probably be able to make sons that can sing loud that will be chosen by females as, in the future. As genes tend as to do. Right. Genes, right? But the other thing it's also telling is they tend to call in the hottest part of the day, and it's really hard to use it to burn that energy in the hottest part of the day. That right? means you're badass. It does. Right. So, it, so if you're able to call really loud and you're able to call in the hottest part of the day. I'm loud and I have stamina, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really hot, but I'm still doing it. That's what they want to see. So yeah, the males are kind of sitting and calling. Um, okay. And then females, and the females answer, but they don't move very far. I mean, to be for all intents and purposes, we're yeah. talking about like a single field. They'll be calling and kind right. of interacting with each other. There's no cicada that's going to be smart enough to find a PA system <laughs> and just kind of sit on a microphone like, yeah, I'm taking. <laughs> wait, wait. Do that experiment. Wait, wait. So what you're saying is the mating radius 
of a of a cicada is not much farther than the field in which they emerged. We think they I have mean, wings, but they can't fly to another county if they're not satisfied with what they see locally. They don't tend to fly very far. No, okay. so they don't tend to fly very far. They can move a little bit with wind as well, but they don't tend to fly very far. They tend to stay kind of local. People have some done population genetics, look at DNA, and kind of it seems to suggest that things tend to stay kind of local. Okay. Okay. Um, but what's cool about it is that like you have a pretty good shot that you're going to find a mate, right? There's a whole bunch of you. You're kind mm -hmm. of all around the same little right. part of trees. Every, you have a pretty every good pot shot. has a lid in the cicada yeah. world. <laughs> <laughs> You're a pretty good shot, right? Females then take that sperm. She uses it to fertilize her eggs. She crawls up to the top of a tree, and she uses an ovipositor, which is an egg-laying apparatus. It's like a little knife. Right. She cuts a hole in a very small branch, not a big tree branch, but a very small branch. She puts her eggs inside, and then she dies, right? Oh, man. I'm going to hold on to my eggs for a while. <laughs> You're no telling. Yeah, I'm like, what, are you, what are you doing? I'm, uh, I, you know, I'm I'll busy. get to it. I'll get to it. <laughs> I ain't ready yet. <laughs> That's pretty much, yeah, it's 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 a short life. Wow. Yeah, they're really just one hot summer, but they're doing all their stuff. So all the adults are dead at the end of the summer. Yeah, all but the adults are dead. But their eggs remain. Well, so the eggs hatch, um, and the larvae that emerge are teeny tiny uh, and they drop to the ground and they immediately burrow under the ground into the soil and then that's their kind of forever home right they move around a little bit underneath the ground but not very much by the time winter has come right the nymph should be under the ground kind of tucked in the soil feeding on the plant sap um, and then they're just going to stay there like i said until either 13 years happen um, and they can emerge uh, they use that based on te um, temperature cues or we do something horrible like we rip up the rip ground, up cut the down the ground, trees, and then the that's tree, the right. end of their story. What's going on for 17 years? They don't just stay that tiny, tiny baby, right? So they molt to larger and larger, what we call so they instars. Grow. They grow. Yeah, they're, okay. they're alive underground. So they're, yeah. they're feeding and they're growing. So Jessica, 17 years ago, you were just a little girl. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So... Is this a yeah. boon to your research? Is this research? the end of your career, Jessica? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it over right now? And it's just like after this summer, you just got to retire. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if it's not a yearly thing, your job is highly episodic. Yeah, well, you can kind of measure out your life by periodical cicada emergences, right? And at oh. some point in your life, you know you're not going to see the next one. If you're tracking a brood, I know some people oh, in sad. Princeton. That's that sad. Yeah, who I are, ain't going to live that long. Yeah, uh, they, I you said say to, goodbye. Yeah, mm. are you going to see the next one? I won't be around, right? But it is, I mean, you can see different broods in different parts of, of the eastern part of the United States. So there are other broods you can see. But if you were really interested in brood 3, really interested in brood 19, really interested in brood 7, you know, then yeah, you kind of are doing, but what people tend to do is they tend to collect data while they can, collect behavioral observation, collect specimens for DNA. Some of that, that one that's in your freezer could be valuable for DNA for all we know, mm, right? Look at that. I went out to the country and I saw some cicadas and I grabbed one and I've had it since then. It's frozen in a little oh, jar. Oh, nice, yeah. Because I promised you I would eat it. Because I asked you, yeah. do people eat cicadas? I mean, yeah, why not? Yeah, let's cook it up. Oh, you got a hot plate? Oh I, oh, I have to cook it first. I would. Yeah. Oh, now you, you tell me. Because yeah. <laughs> I almost ate it. Just oh, thank God. You I mean, you could, I would. Just, they're, and they're, aren't they gushy inside? Uh, they're kind of crunchy because their legs are pretty crunchy. It does have red, beady eyes. Yeah, they have. Unlike the one, there are other cicadas, by the way, that are not periodical, eyes. and yeah. they tend to have greenish or brown eyes. And so if you see ones that are small, smaller than a regular cicada, and that have reddish, beady eyes, yeah, this, that's... Yeah, this, this big. Yeah, mm. that's periodical. Magica cicada. Yeah. That's a beautiful name, right? It's still ugly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Listen, I am a big fan of cicadas uh, for one reason only. If you wait 17 years to have sex... You deserve my respect <laughs> and my compassion. <laughs> so this has been a Star Talk explainer from right here in my office at the Hayden Planetarium of the American Museum of Natural History. When I think about these cicadas, I'm reminded that no matter what we do in our lives, we share this earth with other creatures. And these other creatures are living out their lives on their own schedule, on their own calendar. Yet we, without regard to their lives, will lay down a parking lot, will uproot trees, which is the entire habitats for whole communities of animals and plants in the tree of life. 
So for me, working here as an astrophysicist, but at the American Museum of Natural History, where my colleagues care about life forms of all kinds on this Earth, I'm just reminded that no, we don't own the Earth, nature does. And the sooner we learn that, the better chance we have of surviving ourselves in our own future. That's a cosmic perspective. Until next time, Neil deGrasse Tyson, keep looking up.